Now, children, got another Roscoe story for you today. It's a wee while since we had a Roscoe story, but um, he actually got out again a couple of weeks ago, I'm sorry to say. And that was just somebody who came to the manse and came round the back of the manse. And you know what? Left the gate open. And as he was talking to me, uh, I told him uh, that there was, there was going to be some workmen working next door. So I said to him, tell the workmen, please, tell the workmen, please, to shut the gate after them. And oh, he said, I've left it open. And of course, that was too late because Roscoe was away. And he went up to Gotill and he went round Balmerino and Gotill Crescent. You know, somebody actually videoed him on their phone and they put it up on Facebook because they didn't know who he belonged to and they thought, well, that might be a way of helping to find out who he belonged to. So the video went up on Facebook and so Roscoe is now preparing for Hollywood. No, he's not really, but he's become a bit more famous than he ever was. But you know what? This time, I didn't actually have, although I went out looking for him, I didn't have to go to the police station to pick him up. He actually made his own way home. Don't know how far he got, and I don't know what trouble he got into while he was away, but he made his own way home. And he actually went past the man's gate a little bit, down towards uh, the roundabout, and then he must have realized, oh, I've gone too far. So he came back, and then he came in the gate, because I'd left it open in case he did come back. So that was great. He came back all by himself. He found his own way back and made it back home. Now, I really think that Maybe it's because he was beginning to get a wee bit hungry that he made his way home and he remembered, well, oh, I've got plenty of really nice food back home, so I better go back. I don't know because you can't ask him. But it reminded me of a story that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 15, a story called The Prodigal Son, about a son who left his father's house, took all his money, went away, wasted his money, and then he got into trouble. But he didn't come back home straight away. He got into more trouble and he became really poor until he remembered one day that there was so much food in his father's house. So why should he spend any time longer living where he was? So he said, I'll go back to my father. And you know, that's what he did. And that's a story that Jesus told so that whether we're young or old, if we're away from God, the best thing to do is to get back to God, to go back to God because we know that God will receive us openly and that he'll welcome us back and that he'll forgive whatever was wrong that we did. So when you think of Roscoe, think of the prodigal son. Yeah, that's what he is sometimes, the prodigal son. Think of him coming back home and think of him as we welcomed him back home. Think of, more importantly, of course, the welcome that Jesus gives to all who come back to him and to God the Father. Okay, let's have a wee prayer now before you go through. Lord our God, we thank you today uh, for the sincerity of your invitation to come to you. We thank you for the welcome that you promise us as we come to confess our sin and our need of your salvation. We pray today, Lord, as we pray for that forgiveness, that we may indeed wonder at how rich you are in mercy and in grace, and how welcoming you are for such people as we are when we come back to you. Bless the children, then, we pray today, Lord. We commit them again to your care and ask that you'd be with them today in all their activities and help them to learn more and more of you through your word and bless those who lead them at this time. Receive our thanks and bless them freely for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now let's turn together back to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're looking especially today at verse 8, although we're looking at it in context, so we will refer to some of the other verses as well. But the main emphasis, as in verse 8, is our focus this morning. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Well, the Reformers were looking at these great solas, or uh, these alones of the Reformation. We looked at Scripture alone, and we're coming now to grace alone. We're saved 
by grace alone, and we'll see also, God willing, in future studies, Jesus or Christ alone, and uh, uh, also uh, that uh, there's an emphasis on faith alone, faith in Christ for our justification, and finally, unto God's glory alone, that He alone has the glory in all of that salvation. Now, the Reformers were very clear that foundational issues, foundational doctrines, had to be very clearly stated and understood as they appear uh, in the Scriptures. They really were uh, very, very important to the Reformers to have the basic foundational doctrines set out clearly, and this is one of those that they reckoned and rightly was foundational, that we are saved by grace, not by works, not by a contribution on our part towards being accepted with God. Because if we're wrong in the basics then, as the Reformers often stated, we're going to be wrong in many other things besides in our understanding of what faith is and what grace is and what salvation is. And Luther saw this, of course, as one of the really important doctrines of the Bible, this grace that's mentioned that we are saved by grace. In fact, Luther called it the hinge on which all else turns. He said, if you don't get this one right, then somewhere or else, somewhere or other, you're going to be wrong, seriously wrong elsewhere. If we're not saved by grace, then somehow or other, we've got a contribution, and therefore we've got some glory or boasting uh, in that. Now, he ruled that out, of course, obviously, from the Scriptures. And for Luther, the argument, really, and for the Reformers as well, you see, Luther wasn't arguing against people who would deny that we're saved by grace, or deny that we're saved by Christ, or deny that we are saved by faith in Christ. The, the church of the time, although it had badly lost its way, would have agreed with that statement that we are saved by all of these. And Luther's quarrel was not with that, but with this alone, that we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. And that word alone makes a world of difference, because when you say by grace alone, then it shuts out any other and every other avenue through which we might come to be saved, or means, or ground, or source of our salvation. So that's really the crucial issue for the Reformers. That's what we ourselves uh, still insist upon as taught by Scripture, that we are indeed saved by grace alone. It shuts out works. It shuts out everything else apart from grace. And we'll see what that grace entails um, just in a moment. So it's really by grace alone, just as it's by Christ alone and by faith in Him, faith alone in Him that we come to be justified. So let's look first of all at the recipients of this grace, because it's really important the setting in which uh, Paul set out this emphasis, situated this emphasis that we are by grace saved through faith. And the context, the setting, is where you find in the previous part of the chapter an emphasis on what we are. And what we are as God sees us in need of being saved by His grace. And uh, it's essential that we actually see and take with us these verses, or else you cannot really understand verse 8 at all. You can only understand grace for what it is by looking at it against the background of our sin, of our sinfulness, of what it is we really deserve instead of what we actually get through God's grace. And that's why Paul here is emphasizing for the Ephesians and emphasizing now for ourselves from Scripture, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So there are three things he mentioned about us as recipients of this grace, what we are before we are saved, what we are as God sees us in our sinfulness, well, as we, as we are in ourselves, as we are born into this world, we're dead. You are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. In other words, our spiritual condition is equivalent in a spiritual sense, and a moral sense, to a dead corpse. And it's very obvious whenever you see a dead corpse, if you see one, it's very obvious 
that that cannot bring itself to life, that there is no life there, that life has gone. And he's saying spiritually and morally, that's actually what we are. There's spiritual deadness, there's moral deadness. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We have no capacity in ourselves to live spiritually, to live in a way that God requires of us. That's the first thing. We're dead. Secondly, we're disobedient. Because being dead spiritually and morally doesn't mean we're not active in anything. What he's saying is you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedient. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but in our deadness we are defiant against God. We are resistant to God. We don't want to obey God. That's why it mentions there you're following, we're following the course of this world. And he mentions the prince of the power of the air. And who is that? That's Satan. That's the devil. That's that dark, malevolent power that is still at work in the sons or the children of disobedience, those who have not come to yield, to obey Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, as their Master, who have not come back to God and still follow the course of this world. That's what you were, he's saying to them. In order to understand how you've come to be saved, in order to come to appreciate and to be thankful for the grace that came to save you, the grace of God that actually came and took you out of that condition, you have to appreciate something of that condition or you cannot understand grace. You were dead. You were disobedient. And thirdly, you were deserving of hell. You see, he mentions here, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, destined for the hell that we deserve. Now, I know that's not popular nowadays to even mention or to even think about this as a possibility, let alone a reality, but that is what the Bible tells us, and it tells us that for a reason, and you know it says that for a reason, so that you and I would see that being the kind of people we are, we desperately need the grace of God in Christ. We need the salvation that God provides for us there. Otherwise, what is to be done with us? What is to be our destiny? It is hell. It is being the children of wrath forever. But that's what we are here, naturally, in this life. We are the children of wrath, even like the rest of mankind. It's not just that we are undeserving of God's mercy, but we are ill-deserving. We are deserving of the very worst, the very worst of hell itself. A lot of people have a difficulty, of course, understanding that. Why would such a thing be true of people who try to live a decent life, who've never committed any great crimes, who've not murdered anyone, who've not been engaged in violence or robbery, how can it possibly be that such a good person, as people would say, could be destined for hell? Well, the reason is that we don't appreciate what sin actually is. Sin is not primarily what we do to each other. It's a violation of God's rights. It's a transgression of His standard. It's a rebellious, defiant dismissal of His authority as He's revealed it in His Word, in His law. We are deserving of hell. We are disobedient rebels. We are dead in trespasses and sins. And the reason these verses appear there is so that we'll come to appreciate as much as we possibly can the wonder, the nature, the impact of this grace and how wonderful it is that such people as that can at all be saved, that God would actually bestow salvation and provide salvation for people who are dead and disobedient and deserving of hell against himself in every part of our being until he comes 
by his grace to save us and take us out of that. In other words, we're saved really despite ourselves and despite what we are. Remember um, in that wonderful chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is dealing with the resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus and how without the resurrection of Jesus, we don't have the prospect of a resurrection. And therefore, we have no hope or basis of hope as we saw recently uh, last week with, with First Peter, the hope that we have, this living hope of God's people, it's anchored in the resurrection of Christ. But he then went on to, just as a kind of aside, but a very important aside in uh, verses 9 to 10, he says, uh, this grace, he said, but uh, I'm an apostle, but I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And he's not just saying, were it not for the grace of God, I would not be what I am. He is saying that. But what he is saying also is in a positive way, the grace of God has undoubtedly made me what I am. An apostle, a believer, a saved sinner. That's the re these are the recipients of this grace, and that's why they're so described. But let's move on to the actions of grace. Because as he moves towards this emphasis in verse 8, you come to verse 4. We were all of these things, verses 1 to 3. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So the same emphasis you see there, the end of verse 5, as you have in verse 8. He's anticipating verse 8. But what is he saying here? By but God, being rich in mercy. Uh, it's rightly said by some commentators, and uh, we can under appreciate why this is the case, that in the context, these two words are really the greatest emphasis in the whole Bible. Because here is an emphasis on what we are as lost sinners, as rebels against God, as being dead and deserving of hell, and the children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God. You see the power of that. The emphasis in these two words is just so tremendous. When you appreciate everything that's in verses 1 to 3, then you really begin to appreciate the impact of these words at the beginning of verse 4. But God, despite all of these things in verses 1 to 3, despite all of the things that we were, despite God's perfect knowledge of all of that, despite the fact that it was against Him that all of that was directed, but God, He who is rich in mercy, because of that great love, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. In other words, God was not under an obligation to save anybody. We're completely mistaken if we think that somehow God owed us salvation, that somehow or other we had a right to the salvation that He by grace provides for us. We don't have rights. God is under no obligation to actually bestow that salvation. He's not constrained by anything that he sees in us. It's simply out of his great love with which he loved us. And because he's rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Mercy is not something that God is obliged to show us. He chooses to show mercy. If you like to use the word, he decides to be merciful where he didn't, strictly speaking, have to. But he did. Rich in mercy. By grace, you have been saved. So what is this grace then? Well, you can see, begin to see from that if you didn't have a definition of it before, that grace is essentially the undeserved favor of God towards the undeserving. The undeserved favor of God towards us who are undeserving. It's completely undeserved. The, God, the favor of God, God's favor toward us, God's countenance positively coming toward us, not to condemn us, but to save us. 
God's mind, God's attitude towards us, despite all that we are in verses 1 to 3. That's grace, undeserved favor. And everything that that favor bestows, you can say that is God's grace revealed and God's grace at work. Which is why he says there in verse 9 um, that uh, by grace you've been saved, this is not your own doing, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Now, here's a man who once boasted tremendously in his own achievements. And you can see that in his um, testimony, if you like to call it, in Philippians chapter 3. He says, if anyone had reason to boast, I even more. He boasted in his uh, lineage. He boasted in his birth. He boasted in his being a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He boasted in being a Pharisee. He boasted in his achievements in regard to keeping the law of God as he saw it in his commitment to that. He boasted in his persecution of these people of Jesus. This was a man who really knew what it was to boast. And then he said, what? But what things were gain to me? What I once thought was gain. This I now count loss. I count it, he says, but worthless rubbish, but dung, so that I might win Christ and gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Here's the boaster, you see. Where's he he put his boasting? He's put in the skip. He's put it into the skip of his life. He is saying, boasting? No, I don't want to boast in anything now, in myself, in my achievements, in anything that I think mm, I could by works gain the favor of God. I will boast, he says, but I'll boast in him And I'll boast about Jesus, and I'll boast about His righteousness, and I'll boast about the grace of God. I'll boast about that, but there's no boasting to me, no boasting on my part. How can I? I was saved by grace, not by works. There's nothing to boast of, nothing to be proud of, nothing but to say, Lord, what amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. And so you see, grace first of all, is seen in the accomplishment of salvation. And that means that before we ever lived, salvation was accomplished in Jesus Christ, by God in Christ, and what Christ did in this world, especially through His death and resurrection. And I want you to turn just briefly to Titus, this letter to Titus, which Paul wrote just coming immediately after the two short letters to Timothy. But... um, This letter to Titus at chapter 2 and verse 11. Notice what Paul says there. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and so on. So he's really emphasizing the grace of God has appeared, appeared in Christ especially, and that grace of God that has appeared in Christ has brought or is bringing salvation. It was bringing salvation. When Jesus appeared and was born in this world, that was the appearance of the grace of God bringing life with it. And then you go to chapter 3, and you find uh, an emphasis there on the same thing we're looking at in Ephesians. Uh, the kind of things that we wear, he says, we ourselves, verse 3, were foolish, disobedient, led us slay, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In other words, what he's saying there as it fits in with Ephesians is that in obtaining, in providing, in securing salvation, in accomplishing salvation, that was done by the grace of God in Christ. It's grace that has provided salvation for us. But it also tells us, as Titus there uh, included, that it's uh, in the application of 
of our redemption, of, of Christ's salvation. He didn't just obtain it for us. It's also grace that applies it to us so that we come personally to be saved by the grace of God, just as by the grace of God salvation was provided in Jesus Christ for us. And that's a, an important distinction between the accomplishment and the application. The accomplishment is outside of us. It happened in Jesus Christ. It's been done. The application is the salvation the, that was accomplished there is applied to us. And it's applied to us by the Holy Spirit, as the Shorter Catechism, remember, puts it in uh, Shorter Catechism 30. How does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? And it says it does so by working faith in us, and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. You see, it's all the gift of God. That's what it's saying here in Ephesians 2, verse 8. By grace you've been saved. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Everything that comes to us that's applied to us is applied by grace. It's a product of grace. It's the working of grace. It's God's undeserved favor coming into our lives personally. You see, so it's not simply, you don't simply think of the grace of God in terms of God's attitude toward us and therefore providing us with salvation. It goes beyond that. It's both the attitude of God in providing the salvation and God at work in the application of that salvation. God's Spirit at, uh, God's spirit at work. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith, through what God does in your soul. And you can see that actually that um, in uh, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're saved by grace, not by any contribution ourselves. In fact, he says, we are his workmanship. And that's a beautiful word. Created in Christ Jesus. What it says is, God is really the master craftsman. Because salvation is not just something cobbled together quickly. It's not something without specific design. It's not something without magnificent beauty. It's workmanship. It's God's craftsmanship. A Christian is a product of God's grace. And God's grace always results in beauty, in workmanship, in a work that really is to be admired all the way throughout eternity forever. We are His workmanship. And of course, part of the emphasis there is that how can we possibly be contributors to our salvation if we are in fact the workmanship of God? We are the result of His work. You see, you're not a Christian because of something that you do, by any work that you do yourself. You're not a Christian. You're not saved, uh, not even by the work that you do in repentance or in the activity of your faith. You're not saved because of any of that. These are not the source of your salvation, though they're necessary toward your salvation. You're saved not because of anything you do, but because of what He has done, because of the work of God, of the doing of God, of the grace of God at work. By grace you have been saved, not by works, lest anyone should boast. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Every Christian is a new creation, God has crafted that person with new life. It's not a patch-up job. It's not just a, a renovation, leaving part of the old intact. It's a new creation. Is that where we're at today? Have we come to see our need of grace? Have we come to see our need of grace so that as we read verses 1 to 3, and realize that's what God is saying about me, about you. That it so will turn to God and plead with Him for His mercy. 
for His grace to work in our lives. For that life that He alone can give to be a life that you and I possess. For that righteousness which we cannot create ourselves, as Paul said in Philippians 3, a righteousness, I don't have it of my own or of my own uh, uh, ability, but the righteousness which is in Christ, which is mine by faith in Christ. When you put your trust in Christ, when you believe in Him, when you lean your whole life upon Him for now and for eternity, what happens? Well, the righteousness that is His, the salvation that's in Him becomes yours. It passes over into your possession. And we'll see tonight how from Peter that um, brings out that whole wonderful emphasis of having an inheritance kept or reserved in heaven for us and we being kept by God towards that inheritance. Well, he says that's his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. But you do notice just finally created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's not saying that good works don't enter into the matter of being a Christian or being saved at all. They don't enter into how we come to be accepted with God. That is by His grace in Christ, which we by faith come to receive and to accept. But then that makes us workers. That makes us people of good works. Our good works are not just discounted by the Reformers when they came to emphasize these solas that we're looking at in the Reformation, by grace alone, not of works. That's how you come to be accepted with God. But that's when your good works then come into the picture, because you are saved for good works. You're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The good works are a result of being saved, not a contribution towards it. But you mustn't leave it out. And it's interesting that Luther um, really didn't like the epistle of James. In fact, at one stage he thought it really ought not to be in the canon or the body of Scripture because he saw it as against what he came to uh, be convinced of in Galatians, in Romans and Galatians especially, and also there in Ephesians, that we are saved by grace. And he saw James as emphasizing something contrary to that. I remember how James actually deals with uh, this matter. Um, if you turn to the epistle of James, and we'll conclude with this, um, epistle of James chapter 2 and uh, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then he brings out two examples, Abraham and Rahab. And he says, uh, uh, was it not, in verse 21, was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see then that faith was active along with his work. And the same then of, of Rahab, verse 25, Rahab, the prostitute, was she not also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Now, how do we bring that together with Paul's emphasis? Why was Luther so much against James and what he thought was contrary to the teaching of Paul? Well, we can put it something like this. Paul is asking the question, what is the place of works in relation to our acceptance or being accepted by God, our justification, in other words, being accepted with God? What is the place of our works in relation to being accepted with God? And the answer to that is none. No place, absolutely no place at all. This is by faith alone, through the grace of God alone. No works, no contribution on our part. But James is asking the question, we could put it something like this, what kind of faith is it that leads to acceptance with God? And James answers, it's the one which is seen in our good works. In other words, somebody says, I'm a believer, I have faith. 
I am a Christian, and that person doesn't bother at all in helping their fellow human beings. They're not interested in showing practical love. They just come to church and go away, and that's it. No, what James is saying, that's not faith. That's not the faith through which we come to be justified. The faith by which we are justified is one which is seen, James says, in good works. We are created in Christ Jesus, as Paul says, for good works. So don't decry good works. Don't go to the other extreme in avoiding works as a contribution to your salvation. Remember that we are created in Christ Jesus, that we are Christians by the grace of God, saved for good works. How else will people say that we are indeed saved if we're not showing this product of God's own creation in our good works? So, we are saved by grace. Those people that we are, as described, the recipients of grace, are saved by the grace that's described there in its actions, the grace that has come to us in Jesus Christ in the accomplishment of salvation, and through the Holy Spirit that salvation applied to our hearts and lives, the grace of God at work in that way as well. Let me quote with a, finish with a quotation from a book by uh, an American, Terry L. Johnson. Uh, the book is called A Case for Traditional Protestantism. It came out a few, good few years ago. Um, and in that book, he deals with uh, these solas of the Reformation. When it comes to this one, sola gratia, or by grace alone, this is what he says. Is the battle cry of sola gratia still relevant? Yes, it is. Martin Luther was right. It is the hinge on which all turns. If the doors of self-righteousness are to remain barred, if we are to resist the seductions of the religious systems of merit, if salvation is to remain free to us as God's gift, if God alone is to receive all the glory, then sola gratia is as important to us today as it has ever been. Because if you tamper with the foundational matters, you end up in giving the glory to other than God. We cannot have that. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, today for your grace, for your grace in the way which, which you have revealed it in the providing of salvation for us in the person of your Son. We thank you for your grace at work in the lives of your people, for that grace that comes through your Spirit to work in our recreation in Christ. We thank you for your ongoing extending of grace to us day by day. Lord, help us also to praise you for that grace, and that as we too can follow uh, the writings and the, uh, uh, the sentiments of another who wrote of such amazing grace, and how sweet was its sound that saved a wretch like him. Enable us also to follow in the footsteps of such who have come to extol your name for your grace. And help us to show that grace, O Lord. Enable us in the good works that you have created us unto uh, to truly manifest that you have also come to receive us by your grace into fellowship with yourself. So receive our thanks, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship now singing in Psalm 84. Uh, Psalm 84, that's on uh, page 339. And singing to the tune, Whether Be, we're singing the final verses from verse 8 <coughs> through to verse 12. Lord God of hosts, my prayer here, O Jacob's God, give ear. See God our shield, look on the face of thine anointed dear. And the emphasis in verse 11 particularly fits in with our study this morning for God the Lord's a sun and shield heal grace and glory give 
So Psalm 84 on page 339, singing to the tune, Weather Be, uh, Lord God of Hosts, my prayer here. Lord God of hosts, my prayer here. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.